Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, August the 10th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man, to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside, together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? There they are, in great terror. For God is with this, the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. New Testament reading tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would you would that you reign so that we might share the rule with you? For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and still are, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. 
For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love and a spirit of gentleness? And today is the day the Lutheran Church commemorates the life of Lawrence, deacon and uh, martyr. Early in the third century AD, Lawrence, most likely born in Spain, made his way to Rome. There he was appointed chief of the seven deacons and was given the responsibility to manage church property and finances. The emperor at that time, who thought that the church had valuable things worth confiscating, ordered Lawrence to produce the treasures of the church. Lawrence brought before the emperor the poor, whose lives had been touched by Christian charity. He was then jailed and eventually executed in the year AD 258 by being roasted on a gridiron. His martyrdom left a deep impression on the young church. Almost immediately, the date of his death, August 10th, became a permanent fixture on the early commemorative calendar of the church. And tonight, our Book of Concord reading is the conclusion of Article 28 on church authority, and then the brief conclusion of the Augsburg Confession. And then tomorrow evening, we will begin the Apology, which is the, the defense of uh, the rebuttal of what the Roman Catholic Church wrote against the Augsburg Confession after we had published that. And uh, Philip Melanchthon also wrote that. And we'll be in that for quite a while because it's much more detailed than the Augsburg Confession. So things that may have sounded weird, I guess, in the Augsburg Confession, when you start to unpack it and break it down a little bit more, uh, will make more sense. Okay, so if you're following along in your own Book of Concord, this is Augsburg Confession, Article 28, beginning in paragraph 53. What then are we to think of the Sunday rites and similar things in God's house? We answer that it is lawful for bishops or pastors to make ordinances so that things will be done orderly in the church, but not to teach that we merit grace or make satisfaction for sins. Consciences are not bound to regard them as necessary services, and to think that it is a sin to break them without offense to others. So in 1 Corinthians 11.5, Paul concludes that women should cover their heads in the congregation, and in 1 Corinthians 14.30, that interpreters be heard in order in the church, and so on. It is proper that the churches keep such ordinances for the sake of love and tranquility, to avoid giving offense to another, so that all things be done in the churches in order and without confusion. 1 Corinthians 14.40 compared to Philippians 2.14. It is proper to keep such ordinances just so long as consciences are not burdened to think that they are necessary to salvation, or to regard it as sin if they are changed without offending others. For instance, no one will say that a woman sins who goes out in public with her head uncovered, as long as no offense is given. This kind of ordinance in the church is observing the Lord's Day, Easter, Pentecost, and similar holy days and rites. It is a great error for anyone to think that it is by the authority of the church that we observe the Lord's day as something necessary instead of the Sabbath day. Scripture itself has abolished the Sabbath day, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. It teaches that since the gospel has been revealed, all the ceremonies of Moses can be omitted. Yet, because it was necessary to appoint a certain day for the people to know when they ought to come together, it appears that the church designated the Lord's Day, Revelation 1.10, for this purpose. This day seems to have been chosen all the more for this additional reason, so people might have an example of Christian freedom and might know that keeping neither the Sabbath nor any other day is necessary. There are monstrous debates about changing the law, ceremonies of the new law, and changing the Sabbath day. They have all sprung from the false belief that in the church there must be something similar to the services set forth in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7, and that Christ had commissioned the apostles and bishops to come up with new ceremonies necessary to salvation. These errors crept into the church when the righteousness that comes through faith was not taught clearly enough. Some debate whether or not keeping the Lord's day is not a divine right, but similar to it. They prescribe the extent to which it is lawful to work on holy days. What else are such disputes except traps for the conscience? Even when they try to modify the traditions, nobody will understand the modifications 
as long as the opinion remains that these traditions are necessary and must remain. There, the righteousness of faith and Christian freedom is not known. In Acts 15.20, the apostles commanded to abstain from blood. Who observes this now? Those who choose to eat blood do not sin, for not even the apostles themselves wanted to burden consciences with bondage to traditions. They forbid the eating of the blood for a time to avoid giving offense. For in this decree, we must always keep in mind what the aim of the gospel is. Scarcely any canon laws are kept with exactness. From day to day, many go out of use, even among those who are the most zealous advocates of traditions. In order to treat the conscience properly, we must realize that canon laws are to be kept without regarding them as necessary. No harm is done to the conscience, even though traditions may go out of use. The bishops might easily retain the legitimate obedience of the people if they would not insist upon the observance of traditions that cannot be kept with a good conscience. Instead, they command celibacy and accept no preachers unless they swear that we, they will not teach the gospel's pure doctrine. The churches are not asking the bishops to restore concord at the expense of their honor, even though it would be proper for good pastors to do this. They ask only that the bishops release unjust burdens that are new and have been received contrary to the custom of the universal church. It may be that, in the beginning, there were plausible reasons for some of these ordinances, but they are not adapted to later times. It is also clear that some were adopted through erroneous ideas. Therefore, it would be in keeping with the Pope's mercy to change them now. Such a modification does not shake the church's unity. Many human traditions have been changed over time, as the canons themselves show. But if it is impossible for the adversaries to change those traditions, which they say is sinful to change, we must follow the apostolic rule which commands us to obey God rather than men. Acts 5.29 In 1 Peter 5.3, Peter forbids the bishops to be lords and rule over the churches. It is not our intention to take oversight away from the bishops. We ask only this one thing that they allow the gospel to be taught purely, and that they relax a few observances that they claim it is sinful to change. If they will not give up, if they will not give anything up, it is for them to decide how they will give an account to God for causing schism by their stubbornness. And the conclusion. These are the chief articles that seem to be in controversy. We could have mentioned more abuses, but here we have set forth only the chief points in order to avoid making this confession too long. From these chief points, the rest may be easily judged. There have been, for example, great complaints about indulgences, pilgrimages, and the abuse of excommunication. Our parishes have been troubled in many ways by dealers and in indulgences. There were endless arguments between pastors and the monks about who has the right in parishes to hear confessions, do funerals, give sermons on extraordinary occasions, and innumerable other things. We have passed over such issues so that the chief points in this matter, briefly set forth, might be more easily understood. Nothing has been said or brought up for the rebuke of anyone. We have mentioned only those things we thought it was necessary to talk about, so that it would be understood that in doctrine and ceremonies, we have received nothing contrary to Scripture or the Church Universal. It is clear that we have been very careful to make sure no new ungodly doctrine creeps into our churches. We present these articles in accordance with your Imperial Majesty's edict in order to show our confession and let people see a summary of our teacher's doctrine. If there is anything that anyone might desire in this confession, we are ready, God willing, to, pre pre to present more thorough information according to the scriptures. And that concludes the Augsburg Confession. So tomorrow evening, we will begin the apology with some uh, background material, uh, not a lot, and then we will get into the introduction that Philip Melanchthon wrote. So that's in store for tomorrow. Now we confess the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy Bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore, we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers, bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian church, and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church in the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the power and proof of the holy faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in the discipline and in a right knowledge of you, so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women, according to your mercy, a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy give bodily and spiritually according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels and be a strong help to all who need you, for the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, you called Lawrence to be a deacon in your church to serve your saints with deeds of love, and you gave him the crown of martyrdom. Give us the same charity of heart that we may fulfill your love by defending and supporting the poor, that by loving them we may love you with all our hearts, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.